I did not assign the workbook Wednesday for today, so obviously I can't collect it, but I will assign a workbook assignment for Monday that I'll try to get back on Wednesday. I like the workbook problems during this section because there are a lot of concepts in electrostatics, and one of the best ways to get at those concepts is through the workbook problems. On this last workbook assignment, people didn't follow the directions terribly well. Make sure you follow the, I'm going to have similar problems on the, the exam that's coming up, so make sure, look at your homework. If you didn't follow the directions, make sure you follow the directions on the exam, right? I don't want to take off point because you didn't follow the directions on the exam. So look at your homework, make sure you know how to do what's on the workbook homework because it can easily show up again. Um, good. What I want to do today is step back real thing. What have we been doing? It's, we've been starting to talk about all these really weird things, but let's step back and just give you a quick review. We're talking, in physics when we talked about kinematics first, if we knew the acceleration out of a body, if we knew whether it had uniform motion in one direction and constant acceleration in the other, we could figure out the initial conditions, what we knew, the final conditions, time, acceleration, what we knew, what we didn't know, and we could figure out the motion of the particle. Then we learned that if we knew the net force on a mass, that we could figure out its acceleration so we could find out what made an object <coughs> accelerate we could figure out what caused it to move the way it did. So we worked, first we learned how it moved, then we learned why it moved. We learned to draw free body diagrams. <coughs> we talked a little about, about gravity, and I alluded to the fact that it was a field. Now, we're talking about charged particles. And charged particles have forces on them dependent on the field. The force on a charged particle is, at any point in space is that charge times the electric field. Electric field is a vector, the charge is a scalar. We can find the force on the <coughs> object if we know what the field is at that point. Again, we can go back. Then, we said, well, where do field come from? We have source charges that create fields, and we have the object of interest, which the, that field is acting on. So then we talked about how does a source, how does a field be created from a point, how does a field be created from a wire, how does it become created from a plane. And in general, I alluded to the fact that we could integrate any arbitrary shape, but we, want, we won't do that in this class. I want to stick on the big concept, which is that the, if you have a charge in a field, there's a force on it, and be able to find the field around some short list of objects, a point charge, a plane, a long wire. Then we introduce this idea of Gauss's law, which allows us to actually derive the electric field without the calculus. And we need to reason with Gauss's law, and I want to review that a little bit today, and then I want to go on and talk about this idea of potential again. Potential is another way to describe an electric field, and it does make the connection between the stuff we're talking about here and what we're talking about in the lab. So, reasoning with Gauss's law. What is Gauss's law? We know the charge flows in a volume, and that flux out of that volume, we look at the flux through the surface of that volume, is equal to the net charge inside divided by epsilon naught. Does there have to be symmetry? No. If the net charge inside the box is zero, what is the net flux out of the surface? Zero. Does that mean the flux is zero on every surface? No, there could be flux in one side, flux out the other side. Um, what is flux again? <coughs> Think of it as the number of field lines going through an area. It's in a uniform field. is E dot A. So if the field is going through the area, 
so it's aligned with the area vector, then all that, then we just take the flux times the area, or excuse me, the field times the area, that tells us the flux. If the field isn't oriented in the same direction as the normal to the surface, then we have to take the dot product to see what part of the, to determine the amount of flux. Any questions? <coughs> now, if we have a conductor and there's a field inside that conductor, what will happen to the charges inside that conductor? <coughs> or let's just talk about any charge in a field. If there's a charge in a field, what does that tell us? There is, must be a <coughs> force on it. If it's free to move, what will it do? It will accelerate. So if there is a field inside a conductor, there are charges that are free to move, they will move. They will continue to move until what happens inside the conductor? The field becomes zero. All right. If the field is zero inside the conductor and we've built a surface inside that conductor, what will be the flux? Zero. Zero field, zero flux. So the field inside a conductor will, in equilibrium will be zero. Now if you have oscillating fields outside the conductor, all bets are off. But in general, in this, if you have a conductor it's in a field, those charges will almost instantly move to where the field inside the conductor becomes zero. We're going to stick with electrostatic situations so things are in equilibrium. In that case, the field is zero inside the conductor. So. Now, if we're looking at Gauss's law, we have a spherical object. It's a conductor. We can draw a symmetric sphere outside that conductor, and what will the net flux through that sphere be? So we have inside, we have some spherical conductor, with some charge on it, and we build a Gaussian sphere around it. It has some charge Q. What will the net flux be through that Gaussian surface? Zero, zero. Well, the surface, say, kind of inside surface of the sphere, outside surface. We're outside. Here's our conductor. There's a charge on it. We have a sphere outside of it. There's a charge Q on that conductor. Let's say that there's some radius R on a Gaussian surface. What is the flux out of that surface? Is there a charge inside of it? Yes. So the flux had better be the charge inside of it divided by epsilon naught. What if I double R? Does that mean the flux goes down by 4? Does it mean the flux goes down by 2? Has the amount of charge inside that surface changed? So the flux is still Q enclosed divided by epsilon naught. It does not matter what we do to the size, as long as the charge inside doesn't change, the flux through that surface. Now, if I double R, what happens to the flux? Does it change? No change. Does the surface area change? Yes, the surface area will go up by a factor of 4 if I double the radius. So if the flux doesn't change and the area goes up by 4, what must happen to the field? The strength of the field, the magnitude of the field, goes down by a factor of 4. Flux doesn't change, the area does, the field does. I expand the radius of the Gaussian surface. The flux does not change, the area does, 
it goes up as we increase the radius. That implies, therefore, that the field must go down. Now, what if I shrink the Gaussian surface so that it's inside the conductor? Now what's the field? Zero, because the charge in a conductor goes to the outside surface. How many people have looked at the homework for the next one today and one for? It talks about what happens to the field when there's a insulator. So what we're going to do is now replace this sphere here. Instead of being an in a conductor, we're going to put an insulator there. And we're going to distribute the charge uniformly through that insulator. So the charge is distributed uniformly through the insulator. Are there forces on the charge? If there's a field inside those that insulator, and there's charges inside that insulator. Is there a force on them? You have a charge inside a field, there's a force. Do they move? No. Why don't they move? It's an insulator. Charges aren't free to move on an insulator. So now the situation is slightly different. If we draw our Gaussian surface outside that insulator, there's still a charge of Q inside. Let's go ahead and call this an insulator now. There's the same charge Q on the inside. We have the same Gaussian surface. These are far, far, far apart. How does the flux through the two Gaussian surfaces compare? Well, let's think about it. How does the charge inside them compare? Same. So the flux must be, in fact, even if I put these relatively close to each other, does that change the flux? Not the total flux. It'll change the field shape. There'll be more field coming out this side and less coming out this side because the field lines will be push apart. But the total flux must be the same because the charge inside does not change. I was curious because we were talking before about a hollow conductor and that sort of thing, like the hollow sphere uh -huh. conductor. And you were just saying that it'd be zero inside of it, but we were saying that like it'd be the charge in the middle and then it'd be a positive ring and then it'd be zero and then it'd be positive <coughs> again. Would you like to go over that one again? No, I was just, I was just wondering, so you're talking about something, you're talking about like a solid conductor or insulator in this case? Yes, we're talking solid. Okay. These are solid spheres. Now, let's separate them far apart again. If we draw the field map, or the Gaussian surface now inside the insulator, so it has some radius, but it's smaller than the outside radius, is the field zero in the insulator? Is there charge inside of it? Yes. Therefore, the field is not zero. There must be some flux. Now, what is? How do we figure out the charge inside of a inside of it? Well, if we had a volume here, this sphere has a volume, right? There's four thirds pi times the radius of the insulator cube. Is that right? And if it has some charge Q, its charge density will be equal to the charge divided by the volume. So in this case, it's a lot more like a mass density. That would be equal to, what is it, 3 fourths by R of the insulator cubed. That's Q. Now if we look at 
a smaller radius. So now we're looking at a sphere with R less than the outside diameter. Our volume now will be equal to still fourth thirds pi radius cubed, but now this radius is smaller, so it's a smaller sphere inside the, the insulator. Our charge will be equal to rho times V, but that will just be uh, this V here, four thirds pi radius cubed. density, which is 3 cubed or 4 pi. Pi's cancel, the 3 and the 4 cancel, and we're left with R cubed over R I cubed. So in other words, as we go inside the volume reduces by the cube of the radius. And so then charge goes down with the cube of the radius. All right, so now our flux equals E. Substitute in Q and close now. here is constant except for the radius. So let's see if this makes sense. When we make this radius right out to the edge of the insulator, we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon times q over r squared because this cancels. That is what we expect for all the charge enclosed, isn't it? What if we reduce the radius all the way down to zero. How much charge will be inside that sphere with zero radius? Zero. So we have a zero radius here goes to zero. What happens to the electric field? It goes to zero. And that makes sense because the charge enclosed goes to zero. So inside an insulator, what happens to the field strength? As we look at, as we get closer and closer to the center, the field gets weaker and weaker and weaker until we get to the very center. At that point in time, the field gets zero. 
A very similar argument can be made about gravity. If you're outside the surface of the Earth, we can treat the Earth as a particle. Once we get inside the Earth, if we start to burrow down towards the center of the Earth, the gravity gets lower and lower and lower until if you could get to the center of the Earth, the gravity in the center at the center would go to zero. Now it's a little bit complicated math, but the reasoning is, if you just step back, the charge inside the sphere as you get smaller and smaller sphere inside the Gaussian sphere inside the insulator, the charge goes down by 1 over r cubed. The surface area goes down by 1 over r squared, so the field goes down by 1 over r. So the field gets weaker and weaker and weaker as you go to the center. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it. If we're burrow it down. Now we have charges up here that are creating a field in one direction and charges over here and they cancel. So the net field here ends up only being dependent on the charge inside. Is this any question about how we reason through? Now we did talk about the case with the insulated ball, or to me, a conducting ball inside of another hollow conductor. People want to go over the reasoning that we use there. I see some nods, yes. That does make a lot more sense to me when we're talking about that. And this, I thought we were talking about the same thing, so it, like, just confused me. I thought, cause I thought you were saying, like, the other one was hollow, so. Like this one is a solid insulator, the charge is distributed throughout. Yeah. So as you go inside, there's still, it's yeah, there's, still charge. there's still charge inside. Well, with the, ins the conductor, the charges will move to the surface. No matter what the shape of the surface is. Even if it's a solid. You know, it's a whether it's a solid or if it's a hollow, the charges will go to the surface. Now, what's a little bit odd about In this case here, we have a conductor with charges all around the surface. And now we put a hollow sphere around it. It's also a conductor. Now, since this is a conductor, what must the field be inside the conductor? Zero. So if I draw a Gaussian surface around here, what must the net charge inside that surface be? Zero. Zero. Well, if there's plus Q on this ball on the inside, that means there must be negative Q someplace. That has to be on the surface of this conductor. If this was originally neutral, then the total charge inside that conductor must be zero. If we have negative Q on the inside surface, what must be the charge on the outside surface? Positive Q. But there could be variance on this. What if I started out with this outside conductor had two coulombs of charge initially. The inside has negative two, three coulombs of charge. Can you imagine this situation? So we're going to start out Now we have negative 3 coulombs in here. By the same logic we had here, what must be the charge on the inside of the hollow sphere? It's got to be what's necessary to make the net charge inside there be zero. So this must be plus 3 coulombs. But the 
total charge on the oops, hollow, the outside, or hollow, which is to the hollow sphere, is two coulombs. There's plus three coulombs on the inside. How many coulombs must be on the outside of that sphere? Well, we have three plus the unknown has to equal two. There must now be negative one coulomb on the outside. Now, let's check. For you. If we can close everything, how much total charge is enclosed? Negative 3 plus 3, that's 0, minus 1, negative 1 total. If we look over here, the hollow started out with 2 coulombs. The inside sphere had negative 3 coulombs. The total is just negative 1 coulomb. So we can find the field strength inside this conductor. What's the field strength inside this conductor? Zero. We can find the field strength here. Just by what's inside here. Does the charge out here matter? Doesn't matter. There's only charge, by reasoning by Gauss, we're only looking at what's inside. What's the field inside this conductor? Zero. What's the field outside of everything? It's as if we have a point charge with negative one coulomb. Can everyone reason through this way? If you can't, please visit me. If you want to get this down, I, I will create some kind of question about this. I could ask what the flux is. Oh, that'd be a great question. What's the flux through this surface right here? Inside that connector. I might not even tell you what the charges are inside. Zero, because the electric field is zero. What is the net charge inside that sphere? Zero. If it's a conductor, charges will arrange themselves so the net charge inside that is zero. The net charge the net charge of the inside sphere was negative three. The charge on the inside surface was positive three. Why? Because the net because the field inside at this point inside the conductor has to be zero. That means the ch total charge inside has to be zero. That's how we were able to determine that the inside charge was positive three coulombs. Is there any flux outside the hollow? Is, is there any flux outside here? Is there a net charge inside? Yes. Yes. So there is a flux. And that flux is equal to the net charge, negative one coulomb, divided by epsilon naught. simple, right? Flux equals Q B over epsilon. But the implications, really understanding it, takes a little bit of thinking. Um, all right, so key point here. Conductors in a static in static electric fields, the charges have moved to the outside of the conductor, so the field inside the conductor is zero. Since the field is zero, and potential is the change in field, we'll get to that. The potential inside that conductor is all the same. But it may not be zero. So that'll be something that we'll talk about in a little bit. <coughs> All right.
Um, we talked about electric potential energy. Just like in gravity, we had mg times our change in height. Right, so that's our force times our distance. In electric potential energy, we have our force, which will be um, Q, E, some distance, or E times our distance must be, is our potential. So our change in potential energy is our charge that we're moving from one potential to another. Instead of doing any nasty calculus, we can say that charge times the change in potential will give us the change in potential energy. So potential or voltage is kind of like gravity times height. Now, what I left out here is that, that when we do the work, there has to be the dot product. So I wanted to review, actually, actually I'll, I'll get that in a second. There's one other thing we need to talk about. If we drink, bring two particles together, the amount of work to bring them from very, very far apart to some distance together will be equal to the product of the charges divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times the distance between their centers. So like if I gave you two charged, positive charges and I bring them together, I have to do work. So there's some potential energy that's in this system. That potential energy is a product of the two charges. Now, if one of those two charges is negative, what's the potential energy going to be? It'll be negative. So if I go from out <coughs> at infinity and I have two charges with opposite two bodies with opposite charges, they're attracted to each other, aren't they? So they're going to want to, we'll have to do work to keep them apart. Or if we just release them, that we'll say there's zero energy at infinity. When they come in, the potential energy is negative. The total energy is still zero. What does that imply about the kinetic energy? Must be positive. So we had zero potential, zero kinetic at infinity. As those two opposite charges comes together, their kinetic energy is increasing. That implies their potential energy is decreasing. We have a negative potential energy. Now, what if I have three particles like the homework problem? We have charge A, charge that's QA. And we bring them together. There's some amount of potential energy. U, A, B. Right. Now let's bring a third charge in. We can apply superposition and say we took this much, took this much potential energy was required by putting these two together. That could be either positive or ne negative, depending on whether they have the same or the opposite charges. Then we bring QC in. We can ignore QB for a second and say there's a certain amount of energy required to bring it close to QA. So that would be the potential energy from A to C. And then we have the potential energy to bring C next to B. <coughs> calculate all three of these independently and then add them up. Now you can imagine what happens when you have a fourth charge, right? You have this plus, if you bring QD in, QAD, or UAD, UCD, UDD, you add three more terms. Right? So you can imagine you're building a big nucleus, you figure out the energy, potential energy required to bring all those 30 protons in the nucleus together, yeah, that'd be a lot of work, right? But with hydrogen. Yeah. Stick with hydrogen or helium, it'll be a lot easier. <laughs> but do you see the pattern? You bring the first two together, find the potential energy. You bring the third one in, you find the potential energy, you bring it next to the existing two, and go on. I think you're set to do all your homework. 
But again, we do need to practice dot products. So please, please notice. We have A dot B, that is AB times the cosine of the angle between them. That tells us the component of B in the direction of A, or conversely, the component of A in the direction of B. And we multiply those components. You can also add the x components of A, or take the product of the x components of A plus the product of the y components of A and B plus the product of the z components of A and B, and we add them together. Is there any direction to the dot product? Would we include an I, J, and K there? I see that all the time. I saw that with my statics class, too. I want to kill that idea. The dot product is a scalar. Right? So we do take the x components of each vector and multiply them, and the y components and multiply them, and the z components and multiply them, then we add them up to speed, and we have no direction, there's no i, j's, or k's. So i dot i. 1. i dot j. Uh, j dot k. Put your clickers out. So here are our answers. 0, 1, I hat, J hat, K hat. You guys ready? J, they're in the same direction, the angle between them is zero. J dot J is one. I want to talk capacitors. I want to try to make the calculus less 
frightening. We're going to, in general, look at examples that have less calculus. I can't help with some calculus, but what I want to tell you is electric field can be described by both the field at each point in time and represent it with field lines, or we can also represent the electric field with the potential at every point in space. It's the same thing. We're talking about the same thing, an electric field. But we can describe it with a potential or with the electric field. That implies that if we know the potential at every space, point in space, we can calculate the field at every point in space. And if we know the field at every point in space, we can calculate the potential at every point in space. There's only one caveat, which is potential, like um, potential energy, has an arbitrary reference point. So there can be an arbitrary constant on potential that doesn't matter. You have to choose a reference point and then all the potentials will be a distinct number relative to that reference point. So it's kind of like the constant of integration. So, I think I'll start with the capacitor. We have two very large plates. we know about the electric field outside the two plates? What's the electric field out here? Well, we know the field lines go out symmetrically from both. There's a positive Q here, a negative Q here. The field out here from the positive and the negative cancel. The field out here is zero. What is the field inside the capacitor?